Yes. Well, I will discuss some off-label use, and uh, I have no shares and no patents regarding all these companies which are in my presentation. Well, this is a session of the Council on Cardiology Practice, and since I'm a founding member of this council, I would like to thank um, this behavior here, Pierre Anton, for his presidency in the last two years, and I think we all should congratulate Gonzalo. He was elected as the current president, and as of yesterday, he came into uh, office. Okay, so. Gonzalo, we are happy to have you here with you as a president. You. My topic is My topic is coronary artery disease. Uh, what's new, especially what can you take home from this meeting here? So it's, I really tried in my talk to give you actually really take home messages which you can use in every day. Uh, first, what about new guidelines here at the ESC meeting? Then uh, I will discuss some of the hotline presentations related to coronary artery disease and uh, what about other presentations? Well, the new guidelines were really uh, a hit. I mean, patients and people just lined up to get these uh, brand new guidelines. Actually, we have six new guidelines, so you have to read a lot. And um, regarding to coronary artery disease, of course, the AMI STEMI guidelines are brand new. So I will focus a little bit um, to these STEMI, new STEMI guidelines. If you go online at the ESC website, actually there is a document, uh, you cannot only download the full text, but there's a document called Essential Messages for You. And as you can see here in section one, it says take home messages. So actually I could theoretically skip this part of my talk because you already have the essential messages online. But I will still uh, make some points here which I think uh, should be mentioned as compared to the previous STEMI guidelines. Well, uh, many things, especially the emergency system, have, <clears throat> have been the same. They have not changed. But I put out here for you some sentences. Well, primary PCI uh, capable centers must deliver full day, whole week service to the ambulance. Well, this is not new, but uh, what's a little bit newer than the older STEMI guidelines is that the time limits are a little bit tighter. So if a cath lab is on service, it should be really be able to put the patient on the table within 60 minutes after the initial call. Well, I think uh, in most of the parts uh, in Europe, at least uh, in Germany where I know this uh, should be possible. What about other timings? Um, uh, as you know, of course, primary PCI is defined as the PCI within 12 hours after onset of symptoms, but now the window has a little bit been enlarged to over 12 hours, but only in those patients if they still have pain or still ongoing ECG changes. If the pain is longer ago than 24 hours, actually PCI is not recommended, especially in those patients who are stable and have no signs of ischemia anymore. So not every patient post-STEMI must get on the table. What about the drugs? Bavelrudin has been confirmed in the new guidelines as we have already done this two years ago. It should be preferred over the unfractionated heparin. Enoxaparin may be used if unfractionated heparin is not an option. And here comes an interesting table. Um, at least I thought this is worthwhile to show it and to discuss it. Dual antiplatelet therapy is recommended and this was also new for me actually, as a strict minimum in patients getting a bear stent for one month and in patients getting a drug eluding stent for six months. Well, you might say, I know this, one month for bear stents, six months at least for drug eluding stents, but in the old guidelines we always said, independent of the reperfusion strategy, whether the patient gets a stent or not a stent, you should always give dual antiplatelet therapy for at least 12 months. And now we have this, and it will be interesting how these new guidelines will be transferred into practice because they are somewhat, in this point, conflicting with the previous guidelines. Well, what's the good news? This has not changed according to the previous guidelines. Both new drugs, Prazogrel and Tigagrelor, stay with the same identical level of recommendation of a 1B. So this brings us to the hotline presentations. 
The major problem with the hotline was to get in the room. And those of you who have been here, they probably remember this time, but finally we all got in the room. Uh, Sunday, there was a one major presentation in the hotline presentation regarding coronary artery disease. It's the trilogy trial. Most of you probably have seen the results and the discussion. Um, if not, then yesterday, if you was reading the uh, ESC Congress news, it was the headline saying neutral results from first prasugrel clopidogrel test in medically managed acute coronary syndrome. Well, neutral means didn't reach the primary endpoint. Sometimes uh, neutral is avoiding the term negative. Some people say it was a negative trial. Some people say it was a neutral trial. But we know it didn't reach the primary endpoint. But why? Was, was something wrong with the protocol? Or let's have a look. First, who needed this? trilogy trial. The trilogy trial was needed because if you look at the uh, guidelines of the ESC of acute coronary syndrome without ST segment elevation, you see that both are at the same level of recommendation, but Ticagrelor independent of initial treatment strategy, whereas Prasugrel is recommended only if you proceed to PCI. So the question was if trilogy fills in the missing link for Prasugrel for conservative treatment of patients with acute coronary syndrome. This was nicely presented in the hotline by the primary investigator. And this is the protocol. Of course, you can have uh, all these slides uh, to download. I will not go into detail for the sake of time. But what's important is that the majority of patients, 96%, had about 10 days' time to be randomized to either clopidogrel and prasugrel. And this is important to understand the results. This was a worldwide study in over 9,000 patients. And you know this figure here. It is very interesting because it was striking to me when I saw this. I did not expect this figure because if you think of the Triton trial, the curves separated initially very early. And here we have another Prasugrel mega trial, and the curves are almost identical over one year. And they separate late. And what does this mean? They separate after one year. So that means that these patients probably do not need stronger platelet inhibition in the early phase of the acute coronary syndrome, uh, at least if they are treated medically, which means they are probably at lower risk. But on the long run, probably due to vulnerable plug rupture or progression of disease, they might have an advantage. Unfortunately, this was not significant, and I think because the study was terminated too early. This was a event-driven study, so the number of events were reached, but I think if they would have kept more an eye on this curve, they could have prolonged the study and maybe presented next year at the ESC with a significant result, but we don't know. This is just hypothetical. The curve separate after one year, and even the components of the base data separate, and if you look here, it's all significant after one year, but this is an analysis of a negative trial, so you should always be cautious by subgroup analyses of a trial which did not reach the primary endpoint. The good news is that bleeding was not significantly increased, so Prasugrel is safe in these patients. Take home message. This is the largest randomized trial to date in patients with acute coronary syndrome managed medically without revascularization. This trial, in my opinion, was stopped too early, so all we have is a signal, not a significance. We have a signal in favor of Prasugrel, and it is safe. That's the good news. Will it change the guidelines? No. Will it change my daily practice? I think yes, because if we insert this, this was, uh, I would say, the uh, flowchart in our hospital before Trilogy was presented, and of course we could give Prasugrel only if patients were planned soon for PCI. After Trilogy, I think it is discussable to make the flowchart simpler, and you really have the choice to give either Prasugrel or Tachagrelor according to the contraindications in patients if they do not need long-term anticoagulation or atrial fibrillation. So we, we still in our hospital go along with clopidogrel. If there's no none of these parameters here, you have the choice giving prasugrel or tachagrelor. Hotline yesterday, Monday, 
the shock trial, it was a real shock. Why was it a shock? Because intra-aortic balloon counterpulsation in both recommendations, American, US American, and European guidelines is a class one recommendation. Class one is the highest level you can give, although the level of evidence is lower, but it's a class one recommendation. And this was all based on several meta-analyses like this one, showing that the counterpulsation is superior to no counterpulsation if you put together all these small trials here in this meta-analysis. So the study primary endpoint is depicted here. It was really a shock because people did not expect this. There's absolutely no significant difference between patients with and without intraortic balloon pump in cardiogenic shock. Even the subgroup analyses did not show a trend or something you could really make something of. So the take home message from the shock trial is that it's good, it's a large, actually it's the largest randomized trial of intraortic balloon pulsation for cardiogenic shock. It did not reach the primary endpoint, which was the 30 days mortality. And I think it's from the statistical point of view, it's a very nice example that meta-analyses of small, underpowered studies may often be misleading. So will this change the guidelines? The answer is no. Will it change my practice? And the answer is yes, we probably would use more assistant, left ventricular assistant devices than intraortic balloon pumps. But you might say, hey, why does he say it will not change the guidelines if the level of recommendation was one? Well, because the new guidelines, which just appeared about two days ago, they already put this in the guidelines. So it went to red, which is level of evidence A with a level of recommendation 3, which means don't do it. It is really rare that a method when jumps straight from level of recommendation 1 in one guideline and the next guideline is its level of recommendation 3. So from do it to don't do it. But I think that's consequent. The next study which was presented in the hotline in the same session by William was the PROTECT trial. And why was the PROTECT trial so important? Many of you probably remember Barcelona exactly six years ago, the so-called Barcelona firestorm. Do drug eluding stents increase death? But soon after, we had several analyses showing that this is not true. Drug eluding stents, and this is assured today, do not increase death rates, period. But what about late stent thrombosis? This still is there, so the PROTECT trial was initiated following the Barcelona firestorm, and it was a randomized trial of two of the major drug eluding stents at that time. The one is the Endeavour, and the other is the Cypher. And look here, this is also important. The primary endpoint is after three years. This is why the study went so on so long. And the primary endpoint, this is also for the first time, is a safety endpoint. Usually, the primary endpoint is effectiveness, and safety is by the way, but if you really go for a primary safety endpoint like stent thrombosis, you need about 9,000 patients to show this, to show a 1% difference between the cipher and the endeavor. Worldwide study, very nicely done, very good, very comparable dual antiplatelet therapy in both groups. So here's the result. These are the numbers which were anticipated. So the Endeavour stent was anticipated to have a stent thrombosis rate of 1.5%, and it behaved nicely. It, it did exactly what it should do. The Cypher stent did not behave so nicely. The Cypher stent was better than expected. And this shows you again how a study can be negative because the control group just is not as bad as it was in previous times. So this is why the primary endpoint was not reached. So definite and probable stent thrombosis, if you look in detail, is also very interesting because this has practical meaning. Look here, in the first year, the Endeavour stent had a higher stent thrombosis rate than the Cypher stent. In the second year, it's upside down, so the curves cross. And this shows you how important it is. You need longer follow-up, not just nine months, one year. You need at least three years, maybe five years for follow-up. So what is the take-home message from the, from the uh, trial here, from the PROTECT trial? This is the largest randomized 
head-to-head drug eluding stand trial. It's the first drug eluding stand trial with an adequately powered primary safety endpoint. Therefore, you need about 9,000 patients. This is huge. It did not reach the primary endpoint, and it shows the importance that the study need longer follow-up, especially with drug eluding stents. Will it change the guidelines? No because everything was done according to the guidelines anyway. Will it change my daily practice? And the answer is also no, it will not change my daily practice. Why? Because the Cypher stand is no longer available and the Endeavor stand was replaced by the Resolute stand. And the Resolute stand, as we have seen here in the Resolute Okama trial published in the Lancet 2011, is more or less identical with the Science V stand. So this shows you that when a study is published or presented, maybe the stents are not longer available or used anymore. This was the last study presented in the hotline, uh, the French registry. So this is not randomized, it's a registry for STEMI. Interestingly, look at this. This is in the course of 15 years, how dramatic 30-day mortality went down uh, in France. This is a really good work. And Interesting here, I was surprised to see that. Of course, I was uh, lucky to see that. The mortality went down in all groups, in those who had no reperfusion, unfortunately, in those who had thrombolysis, and those who had primary PCI. So whatever they did, the French, they always had a significant decrease in mortality. Maybe one of the reasons is the huge increase in statin usage, which went from 9.8% up to 89.9%. And... Uh, the other thing, which is not so good, unfortunately, as you can see here, the percentage of younger women increased every year. So this is the percentage, right, is below 60 years. So this should not be, but that's the fact. And the other thing, which is unfortunately regarding women, is that younger women in the last 15 years considerably increased smoking. So they went up and they are on the same height as men now. So what do we learn from the FAST-MI registry? In France, the cardiovascular mortality of patients with STEMI considerably decreased. Good work. Paralleled by a greater use of reperfusion, also good. Unfortunately, there's an increase in the proportions of younger women. Will this change the guidelines? No. Will it change my daily practice? Yes, I think so, because we have to put increased awareness for the growing proportion of younger women among STEMI patients. We have to keep an eye. So I had a little problem today with this presentation because uh, now at 12.15 there's the FAME2 trial in the next room and I was afraid that you leave and go all to the hotline presentation there and I won't like you, would like you to keep here in the room. So I was lucky this morning uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning, 8.26, I got this mail. So the American College of Cardiology uh, distributed the slides for the FAME2 trial even before they were presented here in the hotline. So... <laughs> I'm very happy to present you the hotline before the hotline. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really important, so please give me another two minutes to, to show this. The background is the PCI data in stable engine are really not that good. I mean, we have not proven that we do good to the patient with stable coronary artery disease. Well, FAME 1 was a good trial, but it had not a medically treated group, so there was no control group in FAME 1. In previous trial, revascularization has been guided by angiography. We see a stenosis, you know, the oculostenotic flag, we put in a stent, and that's it. So this study here, the FAME2, had a control group for the first time, and it has a randomized arm, randomization, PCI, plus medical treatment versus medical treatment alone, and if FFR was normal, which means no ischemia, they were medically treated. And the primary endpoint was a composite of all death, MI, and unplanned hospitalization. As you probably know, at the Euro PCR, it was announced that FAME 2 was stopped prematurely because the Data Safety Monitoring Board said this is unethical to continue that study. So, of course, we are very, very uh, anxious to see the results. The good news is there was no difference in death. Even if you put in a stent, if you don't put in a stent, the death rate is low and the same in all groups. But here, and this is for the first time, 
the primary outcomes are presented it, that in the group, FFR guided stenting group, uh, here the uh, events are much rarer than those who did not, uh, were not by FFR group. So in patients on medical therapy, these patients were conservatively treated. They had an increase in cardiac events, whereas those guided by FFR, they had as those like no ischemia. So this is really astounding uh, data. Urgent revascularization is about the same curve. So the big question at the end is, what kind of urgent revascularization was this? And 21% of these patients had a heart attack. Others, 50% had unstable angina. So these are all patients with acute coronary syndrome. So with FAME2, I guess the take-home message is very important. It says that in patients with stable coronary artery disease, FFR-guided PCI improves patient outcome as compared with medical therapy alone. So this is for the first time this has shown in a randomized trial. This improvement is driven by a dramatic decrease in the need for urgent revascularization in patients with acute coronary syndrome. And this is also important in patients with functionally non-significant stenosis. Medical therapy alone resulted in an excellent outcome regardless of the angiographic appearance of the stenosis. Finally, will it change the guidelines? No. Will it change my daily practice? Yes. At least, I hope yes, because I hope that FAME2 will help to get FFR reimbursed in Germany to avoid uh, in unnecessary stent implantations. So you might be interested why I say no, why will it not change the guidelines? Because in the guidelines we've published two years ago, and that's my last slide, in the guidelines we've published two years ago, we already gave FFR a 1A recommendation, and there is no better note than 1A. So the guidelines already have 1A, and now it may be a 1A+. Thank you.